good afternoon, Congressman McClintock. We sure appreciate your time today to talk to the students of the Forestry Challenge about Congress's role in the wildfire crisis. And so um, uh, I have, if you'd like to make an introduction, that would be great. And then I have a few questions for you. Well, thank you very much, Dan. I mean, you know the background as well as I do. An untended forest is no different than an untended garden. It's gonna grow and grow until it chokes itself to death. And then it will fall victim to disease, pestilence, drought, and ultimately catastrophic wildfire. Excess timber comes out of the forest in only one of two ways. Either we carry it out or nature will burn it out. Uh, before modern times, uh, we lost between four and 12 million acres a year to catastrophic wildfire here in California. Then we formed the Forest Service to do a little gardening. That was Congress's first role and did it very well. And, and to truly understand it, we need to go back to the days before forest management, before Western civilization. Um, nature gardens in a very brutal way. And if you doubt that, just abandon your own garden at home for say the next 50 years and, and see what it looks like. We formed the Forest Service to carry out excess timber before it could destroy the forests. So every year, US Forest Service foresters would, would mark off excess timber, would auction it off to the highest bidder. Uh, then logging companies paid us to remove that timber. 25% uh, of the proceeds from federal timber auctions went directly to local communities. The other 75% went to the Forest Service and, and were used to manage and, and improve the forests. Um, throughout the rest of the um, 20th century, the acreage lost to wildfire dropped dramatically. Remember, I said we used to lose between four and 12 million acres a year to catastrophic fire. Because of the Forest Service, uh, we, that dropped down to a quarter million acres a year uh, throughout uh, the last half of the 20th century. The fires that did get out of control stayed out of the crowns. Good timber roads provided emergency access to all parts of the forest to get equipment to a fire at once. Um, in fact, often logging companies uh, were close enough to, to cut fire breaks in the event of an emergency. Um, timber killed by fire was quickly salvaged when it uh, still had commercial value. And the proceeds were put back into our local communities and used to, to replant the ravaged land before the, the brush could lay its first claim on that land. And that era of active forest management worked. It assured healthy and resilient forests for every generation to enjoy. Uh, it produced a cornucopia of, of commerce for our, our mountain communities, as well as a steady stream of revenues for our local governments. But then Congress did something very foolish. It threw it all away. Uh, 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 the uh, environmental left took control and they won a sweeping series of, of, of changes to the law in the early 1970s, including adoption of the National Environmental Policy Act and the Endangered Species Act. They forced out experienced foresters and our land management agencies in favor of ideological zealots determined to remove mankind from the management of our forests and they succeeded. And today those laws uh, require an average of four years to prepare an environmental impact uh, statement before a forest management project can even begin. Endless lawsuits can draw that time out indefinitely. They cost millions of dollars to produce, more than the commercial value of the timber that we once sold. So instead of making the government money to, to put back into land management in local communities, these projects end up costing us money so very little gets done. Um, and that's where the environmentalists have brought us today. Remember I said the Forest Service through active forest management brought our uh, wildfire losses down from between four and 12 million acres a year down to just one quarter of 1 million acres a year. Last year, we lost 5 million acres. Now that's not a new normal. That is the old normal coming back because we abandoned our forests. What can Congress do? The first thing it's going to have to do is overhaul these environmental uh, laws that have made the active management of our forests endlessly time consuming and, and, and ultimately cost prohibitive. Now, we won a major uh, reform uh, back in uh, 2016. That was my legislation, uh, which exempted um, uh, uh, forest thinning projects uh, from the National uh, Environmental Policy Act, actually it's called a categorical exclusion. Um, 
But unfortunately, in order to get it through this, we got that through the House. But unfortunately, to get it through the Senate, uh, uh, we, we had to agree to limit it only to the Tahoe Basin. But what that has done, since it was an act for forest thinning projects in the Tahoe Basin, it's taken the time for environmental review from four years down to less than four months. It's taken the environmental impact reports from about 800 pages down to a dozen or so pages. Um, this authority was used on a 10,000 acre uh, uh, a tract of, uh, near South Lake Tahoe. Uh, that's what saved South Lake Tahoe from the Caldor Fire. When the Caldor Fire was, was bearing down on the city of South Lake Tahoe, it hit that treated patch. The fire laid down and we were able to put it out. But unfortunately, that right now, that, uh, that authority extends only as far as the Tahoe Basin. I have introduced legislation in every session since then to expand it uh, to the entire forest service system. Uh, but unfortunately, in Nancy Pelosi's Congress, we can't even get a hearing in natural resources. So Congress has a very important role to play. It, cre it, it, it established the Forest Service that introduced an era of active forest management, healthy and resilient to, uh, forests, uh, minimized the damage to our forests through catastrophic fire. Then it passed laws that essentially uh, uh, made uh, the Forest Service useless. And now we've got to restore what we once had. We know how to properly manage a forest. We did so for nearly a century. Uh, but that's going to require massive overhaul uh, of these uh, these laws that the so-called environmental left uh, has imposed over the years. So question for you, um, as far as the law in the Tahoe Basin that you would like to introduce to apply to all national forests, would that be an opportunity you might have if um, your party was in the majority? You oh, have yes, the right have, to introduce no that committee. Yeah, no, no doubt at all. Uh, when we uh, uh, reclaim the majority, which I think will happen this November, we will be able to pass that legislation, and we will, uh, certainly out of the House, hopefully out of the Senate. Uh, the chances of uh, Biden signing it, well, that's, that's kind of a crapshoot. But I will tell you this, uh, Randy Moore, who is the uh, superintendent for the Forest Service for Region 5, California, including California, um, uh, worked with that law extensively and, and has praised it as being one of the most effective forest management tools they have uh, uh, for fuels management. Uh, Randy Moore, as luck would have it, is now the uh, chief of the U.S. Forest Service in the Biden administration. Uh, so, you know, perhaps we even have a chance of, of, of turning around uh, uh, Joe Biden on this issue. We'll see. Okay, so so you're saying step one is to, is for Congress to give the Forest Service the tools they need to do the work. And exactly to, right. And to uh, step or push aside any impedance that they have to accomplishing what they need to accomplish. Correct. And, and then another thing that I think is desperately needed after, uh, after the, the recent Tamarack fire uh, is to restore the Forest Service's old 10 o'clock rule. 10 o'clock rule was simply this. Um, if a fire is discovered anywhere in the National Forest Service, it needs to be put out by 10 o'clock the next morning. Um, that, again, same period of time that, that these environmental laws were being passed, uh, uh, the, uh, the 10 o'clock rule was abandoned uh, in favor of a policy to let fires burn. And, uh, it, it, especially if they are started by natural causes. Well, on July 4th last year, a lightning bolt uh, uh, struck a tree um, uh, in the Toyabe uh, National Forest. Uh, it um, smoldered over a quarter acre for 10 days. The Forest Service knew about it, sent helicopters over the fire every day to take pictures to put on their Facebook page, but never bothered to drop a bucket of water to put the damn thing out. Uh, on July the 14th, it exploded out of control. It ultimately consumed, I believe, 70,000 acres, cost us millions and millions of dollars to combat, uh, cost several dozen families their homes. Um, and that has been a tale repeated over and over again. In fact, 30 years before, the Woodford's fire was in the same area. Um, and the same thing happened. Local fire department responded to the fire to put it out. 
the Forest Service told them to back off it was Forest Service land and this was going to be a let burn fire. Uh, and that exploded out of control, uh, uh, consumed 30,000 acres, uh, took out uh, several dozen homes. But it's, it's a story that's been told over and over again. The, the catastrophic Yellowstone fires in 1988 were also caused by this let burn policy. Um, uh, uh, when Ronald Reagan found out that the Forest Service had adopted this policy, he ordered them to abandon it and go back to the 10 o'clock rule. Unfortunately, the next year, Ronald Reagan left and, and the let burn policy returned. Uh, so uh, uh, that, the, the bill that I've introduced uh, requires that the Forest Service uh, give top priority to any fire they discover uh, for an initial attack. Um, uh, th that's absolutely essential. Uh, you know, they say, well, you know, many of these fires in remote areas and they're gonna burn themselves out. They're not doing any real harm. So we just, you know, we just, you know, that's nature's way of cleaning up the forest. Well, my response is, is simply this. If you discovered a rattlesnake curled up in the corner of your bedroom, you're not going to just monitor it because it doesn't have to be doing anything in the moment. You're gonna kill it before it does cause harm. And that's what the Forest Service used to do very effectively. Uh, with our fires and it needs to again. And so this bill reinstates the 10 o'clock policy as a matter of law. And it also forbids uh, these uh, teenage hotshot crews from lighting backfires without the uh, authority of the incident commander. We had in the uh, Caldor fire uh, uh, chilling reports of massive backfires being lit without any authorization from on high. Uh, and then abandoning those fires, um, uh, in, in several cases, costing people their homes. Um, so, you know, we've got to get control of that again as well. So a question I have for you is how can, how can um, policies, laws be crafted to incentivize, truly incentivize the fires being put out? Uh, there are some who would say that fire is big business and there's this no massive, um, you know, there's money to be made out of, out of fire, the whole um, industry of fire. And so well, I, my, I think the, the, the incentive for forest managers is to go back to the system that we had when excess timber was auctioned off for bid every year. That was their stream of revenue. They protected that stream very carefully. They, they, they were, you know, if, if, a, if a fire burned out of control and, and, and took out 100,000 acres of, uh, of forest land, that was a direct impact on their budget uh, because that that land was producing revenues for the Forest Service. Uh, I think we need to get back to that incentive structure where the Forest Service begins looking at our forests again as the valuable resource that they are. Uh, uh, the reason we have a Forest Service is to manage those resources for the uh, um, betterment of the entire country and to produce healthy and resilient forests that don't uh, uh, burn um, uh, you know, when nature chokes them off. Okay. Um, well, I appreciate all that. A um, couple more things before we wrap up. I'm, I'm just wondering, um, as far as short term and long term, the Congress's role in this whole situation. I mean, I guess you could consider these the laws that you're that you're introducing to be sort of short term. Um, solutions. Oh no, no, no. These are not. These, no, no. This these, is because they're again, permanent. They would be long term. Nothing theor there's nothing theoretical about these reforms. This is the way we used to manage our forests, and it was extremely effective. Not only do we have healthy and resilient forests, but we had thriving local economies because of the um, of, of the logging industry uh, and all of the spinoff jobs that that produced. And remember, when we auctioned off federal timber, 25% went right back into the local communities. They went right into local coffers and the other 75% managed our, our forest uh, uh, system. It worked, it worked extremely well. It worked until we abandoned it uh, starting in the uh, 1970s with the environmental movement. And I think after now close to 50 years of experience with these laws that were all enacted on the promise that they were going to improve the forest environment. I think after 50 years, we're entitled to ask, well, how's the forest environment doing? And the answer is absolutely damning. And as I said earlier, an untended forest is no different than an untended garden. You leave your garden alone for 50 years, you know what it's gonna look like. That's what we've done to our forests under, under the excuse of environmentalism. 
Well, it's been environmentally disastrous for the forest because it turns out nature's a lousy gardener. Well, and I wonder if there's some way to um, to create policy that would that would be outcome based. Here's what we want. How you get there is is you know up to creative management. We did that. Again, this is this is the thing that drives me nuts. This is not a theoretical exercise. Mm -hmm. This is how we used to very successfully manage the forest. We did so for nearly a century. We preserved those forests to pass on from generation to generation. We took care of the forests. And we uh, brought significant uh, uh, commerce out of those forests as well as a result of that management. This is not theoretical. We're not groping in the dark for some new idea. The old way of doing it worked perfectly or nearly perfectly until we abandoned it. This is something that's just so frustrating about political science to me. You know, in the physical sciences, we make a discovery that's built into our knowledge base. We build then upon it and we advance. In political science, uh, 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 we uh, make a discovery of something that works and we quickly abandon it in favor of something that doesn't work because the thing that doesn't work sounds more pleasing for some reason. Uh, th this is just crazy. We know how to do these things. This is not a matter of inventing new policy. It's a matter of restoring the policies that worked and worked extremely well for nearly a century until we foolishly threw them away. Okay. Well, that, that's interesting. And just, you know, giving the students something to think about as they come up with ideas and, you know, returning, like you said, returning to the past could be the, could be the future. So. We, we, uh, we don't need new ideas. We need to restore the old ideas that worked. Okay. All right. Well, I sure appreciate your time today, Congressman. Um, I'm, I'm going to stop the recording very soon and then uh, we can wrap it up. But thank you again. I do appreciate your time. I'll be showing this. The students will be seeing uh, this recording and I think we'll learn something from it. So thank you. Brian, thank you.